Hello. Today we're going to talk about the mathematics of ballistic missile launch. This is an application of the Kepler's problem, also known as the two-body problem. In the next video, we will use real data and the results derived in this video to estimate North Korea's missile capability. Suppose that a projectile is fired from a planet's surface with initial speed v0 and elevation angle of phi. The task is to find the firing range d, that is the arc distance on the planet's surface between the launch point and the point of impact. Also, we wish to determine the height h of the apogee, that is the point furthest away from the planet's surface, as well as the flight time t. We're going to make a few simplifying assumptions. First, we assume that the planet is spherically symmetric. This allows us to apply the shell theorem, i.e. the planet affects the projectile gravitationally as if all of its mass is concentrated at its center. And second, we're going to ignore aerodynamic forces as well as non-inertial forces. This means we do not consider things like airlift and air drags as well as centripetal or Coriolis forces. And lastly, we assume that the projectile undergoes an unpowered flight. That is, except at the initial instance, there is no force propelling the projectile. It travels solely under the influence of the planet's gravity. To solve the problem, let's first recall the solution to the Kepler's problem. This was derived in a previous video, link in the video description. The solution to Kepler's problem says that the flight trajectories are conic sections whose polar equation is given by r equals to p divided by 1 plus e times cosine of theta. The origin is at the center of the force field, and r is the distance between the projectile and o. The polar angle theta is measured from the perihelion of the trajectory, that is, the point on the trajectory that is closest to the origin. Here, p and e are parameters of the trajectory. p has a dimension or unit of length, and E is dimensionless, called the eccentricity. When E is zero, the trajectory is just a circle. When E is greater than zero, less than one, it is an ellipse. When E is equal to one, it is a parabola. When E is greater than one, we have a hyperbola. P and E are in turn determined by the conserved mechanical quantities during the flight. If we write alpha equals to big G, big M, little m, that is the universal gravitational constant, times the planet mass, times the projectile mass. Then p is equal to l squared divided by m alpha, where l is the conserved angular momentum. And the eccentricity little e is given by the square root of 1 plus 2 e p divided by alpha, where big E is the conserved total energy of the orbit, that is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. As we can see in the diagram, h and d are determined by the shape of the orbit and how it intersects the planet's surface. Therefore, our first goal is to determine p and e in the conic section equation from the initial conditions v0 and phi. Let's go. We start by decomposing the initial velocity into radial and tangential components. Recall that the angular momentum is defined as the cross product between the radius vector and the linear momentum. Therefore, only the tangential component of the initial velocity contributes to the angular momentum. So we have L equals to m times v0 times cosine of phi times r as the angular momentum. And the total energy, big E, is given by half mv0 squared, that's the initial kinetic energy, minus gm little m divided by r, that's the initial potential energy. These are the conserved angular momentum and total energy respectively from which we can calculate the conic section parameters p and e. We will also use the relation gm equals to little g times r squared, where little g is the acceleration due to gravity on the planet's surface. The important relations we have so far are collected in the left panel. From those, we can express p and e in terms of the initial speed v0 and the launch angle phi. The result for p is v0 squared over g times cosine squared of phi. And the result for e squared is 1 plus v0 squared over gr times v0 squared over gr minus 2 times cosine squared of phi. We define k equals to v0 squared over gr. This is a dimensionless quantity proportional to the kinetic energy. So e squared is 1 minus k times 2 minus k times cos squared of phi. Due to the nature of our application, 
we want e to be greater than 0 and less than 1. Otherwise, the orbit would be a parabola or a hyperbola, which are unbounded, meaning the projectile will never return to the planet. And for this reason, we assume k is between 0 and 2. This way, e squared is 1 minus something positive and is therefore less than 1, and e is between 0 and 1. Let's now go back to the original diagram. We denote theta as the angle made between the radius vectors between the launch position and the radius vector of the apogee, since the launch position is one of the intersections between the orbit and the circle. We have r equals to p over 1 plus e times the cosine of pi minus theta. This is because the polar angle of the launch point is pi minus theta. Cosine of pi minus theta is minus cosine theta. Earlier, we obtained p is equal to v naught squared over g times cos squared of phi. Substitute that in and simplify, we get 1 minus e times cosine of theta equals to k times cos squared of phi. We can then solve for the cosine of theta, and we get 1 minus k times cos squared of phi divided by e. We can express this relation diagrammatically in a right triangle. The hypotenuse is e, and the adjacent side is 1 minus k times cos squared of phi. So at this point, we have theta, and as a result, we have d, which is just 2 theta times r. We may wish to verify that this expression for the cos phi makes sense. That is, it is between 0 and 1. To do so, we may calculate the length squared of the side opposite to the angle theta, which is e squared minus 1 minus k times cos squared of phi squared. And the result is k times cosine of phi times sine of phi together squared. This completes the right triangle we drew earlier. The projectile's range, d, is equal to 2r times arc cosine of 1 minus k times cos squared of phi divided by e. We now find h, the height of the apogee. Let's denote o, the center of the planet, and h, the apogee. On the diagram, we can see that the distance from o to h is little h plus big R. But since O is a focus of the ellipse, we have another way to express the distance from O to h. We recall a fact about ellipses, that is, a focus has to lie on a major axis, and the distance from the center of the ellipse to its focus is AE, where A is the major axis. So by comparing these two diagrams, we have the distance from O to h is also equal to A plus AE. So, so far, we have an equation for h. Due to a property of the ellipses, the major axis a can be written as p over 1 minus e squared, using the expression for e squared and p earlier, and we have a equals to r over 2 minus k. So, h is a times 1 plus e minus r. Simplifying, we get our second result, which is h equals to r times k plus e minus 1 divided by 2 minus k. We have one final quantity to determine, that is, the flight time. But before that, I would like to discuss the maximum range of the projectile. We are interested in finding the maximum value of d when k, and therefore the initial velocity, is a constant. So d can be considered as a function of the launch angle phi. We notice that d of phi is a constant times the arc cosine of an expression. Arc cosine is a decreasing function, so d is maximized when the expression inside the arc cosine is minimized. For this reason, we define c to be the cos squared of phi, and we call the expression inside arc cosine as f of c. So f of c is 1 minus k times c over the square root of 1 minus k times 2 minus k times c. k is treated as a constant. And obviously the new variable c is between 0 and 1. And as we mentioned, d is maximized when f is minimized. Let's calculate the derivative of f of c and see if f has any critical points. Differentiating f of c is straightforward, so I will not read it out loud line by line. This is the final expression for f prime of c. We wish to determine the sign of f prime to see if f is increasing or decreasing. That's the first derivative test in calculus. Uh, k squared is always positive. And the denominator is always positive, so the sign of f of prime is determined by the numerator. Since c is between 0 and 1, the numerator, 2 minus k times c minus 1, is greater or equal to minus 1, less than or equal to 1 minus k. 
Remember our earlier assumption about k. k is between 0 and 2. We consider two cases as follows. Let's look at the first case. That is, k is greater or equal to 1. In this case, 1 minus k is less than or equal to 0. This makes f prime non-positive for all c between 0 and 1. That means f of c is a decreasing function. We see earlier that d is maximized when f is minimized. And since f of c is decreasing, and since f of c is decreasing, f is minimized when c is equal to 1. And we calculate f1 to be minus 1, noting that k minus 1 in this case is positive. So we have our max range equal to 2r times r cosine of minus 1. And that is exactly 2 pi r, which is the perimeter of the planet. And this is an illustration. The yellow circle represents the planet, and the red ellipse is the orbit. So we conclude in the case where k is greater or equal to 1, the projectile can make a full orbit when fired in the tangent direction of the planet. We remark that in the critical case k equals to 1, which corresponds to v0 equals to the square root of gr, the orbit would be a circle which coincides with the planet's surface. The quantity square root of g times r is called the first cosmic velocity. Moving on to the second case, where k is less than 1. In this case, f prime can be both positive and negative. And if we set f prime equals to 0, we get the critical point. The critical point c star is 1 over 2 minus k. By analyzing the sign of f prime, we see that f is minimized at the critical point c star. Recall that c is cos squared of phi. So the critical point c star corresponds to the launch angle phi star, that is the inverse cosine of 1 over the square root of 2 minus k. And the angle phi star is visualized in this right triangle. Therefore, d max is 2r times the inverse cosine of f minimum. We may visualize f min as the cosine of an angle theta star. The opposite side of theta star is just k. The opposite side of theta star turns out to be k. So d max can be equivalently written as 2r times the inverse sine of k over 2 minus k. To conclude, we have phi star, that is the optimal launch angle, and d max, the max firing range. Let's calculate the flight time. For that, we will use the Kepler's second law which states that the area swept out by the radius vector is proportional to time. Therefore, we have the following relation, that is, the flight time little t divided by the period big T of the orbit is equal to the area of the elliptic sector ABO divided by pi AB, which is the total area of the ellipse. Here, little b is ellipse's minor axis, and the period big T is physically unrealizable because the orbit is clipped by the planet. The period is given by the Kepler's third law, which is 2 pi times the square root little m a cubed divided by alpha. Right away, we can get an expression for big T, because we calculated a earlier, and this is the result. The tricky part now is to calculate the area a b o. To do so, we will enclose the elliptic orbit by an auxiliary circle, and then calculate the area ABO using a scaling argument. We now have a purely geometric problem. We wish to calculate the area of the blue region ACF. AC is an elliptic arc whose axes are A and B. F is a focus of the ellipse. The auxiliary circle encloses the ellipse, and it has a radius of A. Point B is the orthogonal projection of A onto the major axis and a prime is a point on the circle so that a prime a and b lies on the same straight line. The ellipse can be seen as a vertical compression of the circle by a factor of b over a. Therefore, a prime b is a b times a over b. The sine of the angle a prime oc is equal to a prime b divided by the length a prime o. Since a prime o is the radius, which is just a, the sine of the angle a prime oc is ab divided by b. By the same scaling argument, the area of interest, that is acf, is the area of a prime cf times the scaling factor b over a. The area of a prime cf is the area of a prime co, that is a circular sector, plus the area of a prime fo, which is a triangle. 
and both areas are easy to calculate. The area of A prime C O is half A squared times the angle A prime O C, which is arc sine of A B over B. The area of the triangle A prime F O is half times A E times the height A prime B, which is equal to A B times little a over little b. Simplifying, we have the expression of the area ACF as follows. Applying this result to our original problem, and we get that the swept area equals to a times b times the arc sine of r times sine of theta, that is the half length of the chord ab, divided by little b plus ae times r times sine theta. Using a formula from analytic geometry that says b is equal to a times the square root of 1 minus e squared, Using a formula from analytic geometry which says b is a times the square root of 1 minus e squared, we obtain that b is big R times the square root over 2 minus k times cosine of phi. So now it's time to bring everything together and solve for the flight time little t. So by the Kepler second law and the expression for the area ABO we had earlier, we now have an expression for pi times little t over big T in which we need to calculate r times sine theta over little b. Using the right triangle we constructed for theta earlier, we have r times sine of theta over b is the square root of k times 2 minus k times sine phi over e. Plugging in the expression for big T, and we get the following formula for the flight time. And we get the following formula for the flight time, which is a bit complicated. So now all of the flight characteristics have been solved, and the results are summarized here. Given v0 and phi, we first calculate the dimensionless quantities k and e. We can then calculate the firing range, the height of the apogee, and the flight time. And here is another summary for the optimal arc. That is the arc with max range given that v0 is fixed. So that's it for today's video. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.